So thank you very much for joining us again. And next up, we have Stefan with his talk on cracking hashes. Take it away. Thanks, Doug, for the introduction. So uh, hi, I'm Stefan. Um, I'm part of the May cohort, and I, I'm in my um, penultimate um, project week, which means that next week um, there will be like a final presentation. So this is like a great opportunity to have a little bit of a dry run to practice like speaking in front of people. Um, I got this idea for the lightning talk a couple of weeks ago when I was going through a box of old stuff and I found uh, this thing. For those who can't see it in my hand, it's something like this, a very like easy or basic combination lock. And I had completely forgotten a combination. So I had to like play around a bit and eventually I managed to like open it. And then when that happened, there was like a certain amount of like satisfaction and it, because it was, was quite fun to do it. Then it was like, I thought, is there any other area where I can apply like this kind of like cracking something? And because I'm in the middle of a bootcamp, I thought, well, the next logical thing is passwords. So today I'm going to talk about password cracking. And then um, I chose this topic basically for two reasons. One is like, at some point we'll be developers and it kind of makes sense to have like an idea of like what's going on, how passwords are stored and what people do to, in order to crack them. And the second angle is um, like normal people. I think it makes sense to create a certain amount of awareness. Um, and you'll see why um, later on. Before we talk about the actual cracking method, um, let's look at how passwords are actually stored. So I'm going to talk about online passwords. And in general, there's like two different ways. One way is the obvious one. We have a database and the database has two columns and we have like a username and the password. So if a new user signs up and you put in your username, your password, and it gets stored in the database. The thing is plain text is a terrible idea for two reasons. One reason, if you have like some kind of employee who's a bit naughty and has access to the database, then this person has access to all the passwords and can like give them away. And then um, terrible, terrible idea. And the second reason is if it ever, if your database has a leak, if it gets dumped on the internet, then everybody has access to this information and can log into people's account. That's why most passwords are stored in a different way. And it looks something like this. You still have your username, but a password is something that looks like this accumulation of like letters and numbers on the, on the right. And this is called like a password hash. So it's some kind of gibberish. And um, there's no, basically no connection between like the original password and this kind of um, hash value. And the good thing is if something like this gets leaked, it's much more difficult to guess what your original password is. Um, so let's have a look at how these password hashes are actually calculated, where they come from. So on a very basic level, we have our plain text password at the very beginning, like here. And then once we send it off to our website, it goes through like a hash function. The hash function does loads of, loads of different things. It, it like iterates it, it pads it, which means it, all the hashes will have the same length. And at the end, we have like a hash password. And the idea is this way of calculating the hash is very easy, but the reverse way, if you wanted to reverse engineer the original password from the hash is very difficult. That's why it's called a one-way function, which is technically not quite correct because with enough processing power, it would be possible. And with a lot of time, it would be possible to create the plain text password from the hash password. But the better the algorithm, the more difficult it is. That's why sometimes people refer to it as a one-way um, password transformation. So that's the general process of calculating a hash. And there's like different hash algorithms, al algorithms out there. One is MD5, which is a bit older. And this is an um, example. So I took the password, password 1234. And if you calculate the hash value, it looks something like that. And then um, the interesting thing about hash algorithms is if you change just one letter or one character, in this case, I changed a four to a five, the hash value looks completely different. And this is like one of the, the good features about these functions. If, if there's like slight variations in the password, the hash looks completely different and it's uh, even more difficult to guess. And also you can see um, the, the hash has like the, the same length and it's longer than the original password. And it's like defined by the hashing algorithm um, itself, how, how many characters it displays as the hash value. There are other hash functions out there. 
One is called SHA-1 or SHA-512. And you can see a difference is, I chose the same password, a difference is that the length of the actual hash and the more complex a hash algorithm, um, usually the longer the hash value, which means that it's more secure. And um, yeah, and, and this is one of the more recent ones, SHA-512. It's a very long one. It means it's very difficult to like crack this kind of hash. And there are other ones as well, but I guess SHA-512 is currently like the most used one. Okay, how do we actually crack passwords? And then um, when we try to, to hack into an online account, sometimes we have like additional safety measures, like we have a limited number of attempts, or we have to check this box that says we're not a robot. So that's very difficult. So what I want to focus on is basically when passwords or passwords hashes get leaked, which happens quite often, LinkedIn, Facebook, Google, it happened to all the, the major tech companies, they get leaked, uh, onto the internet and then normal people have access to basically the username and this hashed password value. So, so how do we crack that? Um, let's have a look at the first method, which is the most obvious one. It's called brute force. And it's basically what I did with my, with my little combination lock. I started with like one combination, like 000, and then I iterated 001, 002, and at some point I cracked it. And for, for this example, let's assume we have like a leaked hash, and now we want to recover the original plain text password. How do we do that? And then um, let's assume it's a four character password with just lowercase characters. So we'd, we would start with AAAA and calculate the hash value. Then we compare it, it doesn't fit. Then we iterate and we say AAAB, we do the same thing again, AAAC and so on. And if you're really unlucky, uh, we get to ZZZZ, and that's like the hash value that fits. And then we know the plain text password for this kind of hash is ZZZZ. The thing is, if we do it like this, it can take a really long time. And also, the longer the password gets and the more characters we use, it becomes like really almost impossible to crack this password in a reasonable amount of time. And speaking of, about time, um, we have a table here that basically calculates how long it takes in the worst case if we wanted to crack passwords of different length and different character sets. So here we have the password length from four to 16 characters, and we have um, the number of unique characters from like 10 to like 95, if we include all the special fancy um, characters and symbols. And uh, you can see, and the assumption is that we use some kind of graphics card, which I think is already a little bit outdated, and it has the potential to calculate 30 million attempts per second. So if we do the math, then you can see if the password is relatively short, and if it doesn't contain many unique characters, it takes like seconds or just a few minutes to calculate um, or crack the password. If it gets like longer, and if we include more and more individual or unique letters, it takes like many, many years. So that means the longer a password gets and the more complex it is, brute force is not, very, it's not a very good method to use. So we have to be a little bit smarter about it. Um, that leads us to like a dictionary attack. And the idea is, again, like as an example, my combination lock. So this is like the, the sequence that I used. I started with 000 and I would have ended up with 999. Um, this makes perfect sense if we assume that all the possible combinations are distributed equally. The thing is, or the good thing is, or maybe it's a bad thing, people choose passwords not at random, and they have preferences for certain combinations over other combinations. And then in terms of the combination lock, um, let's think you know, someone choose this kind of combination. This person would probably wouldn't use three digits that are the same. So we, we can assume that or we, the idea is to use these sequences them at the very end. And also sequences that start with like, with like one or two, we would try them at the end. And that's kind of how we build our dictionary. So instead of like using this first sequence, we kind of change it to like a different sequence and hope that by doing that, the probability that someone uses like one of these combinations is like way higher and the less likely ones, that's the ones um, we try at the very end. And we can do something similar with like passwords. And um, so let's build up our dictionary. And the first element is common passwords. 
And thankfully, um, loads of passwords get dumped on the internet. And they're like companies who compile lists with the most common passwords. And there's a list from like 2016 to 2019 with the most common passwords. Um, there are not really that many surprises. One, two, three, four, five, six, password. Um, I think we all kind of expected that. And then um, if you see one of your passwords on there, I would suggest that you stop the live stream right now <laughs> and change it straight away and feel a little bit ashamed maybe. And, um, and the thing is, this, those are just the most common, the 20 most common ones. And people who compile these lists have like thousands, tens of thousands, and even like millions, millions of passwords. So this is like, this is how we start to build our dictionary, most common passwords. The next step is to include patterns. Patterns could look something like this. And um, I have to admit, I'm guilty, especially of number 10. I really like this pattern when I choose passwords or when I chose passwords in the past. And um, just the fact that I can show this to you means that people who want to crack your password know that that's what we want, that's what we do when we try to come up with a new password. We use like, we try to be smart and use fancy patterns on the keyboard. It doesn't really work like that. And that's one kind of pattern. Another pattern is substitution. So replace ms by five or an ad sim, an a by an ad symbol. And then maybe we end, some, we end up with something like this where we have the word butterfly and it turns into something that no one remembers. Um, so we include that into our dictionary and that leads, our to, leads us to our final step, which is personal information. We share loads of stuff all the time, photos, um, where we've been on holiday, and what kinds of friends we hang out with. And the thing is, people can like scrape the internet and your social media accounts for this kind of information and kind of include that into our dictionary. And then um, again, like <laughs> full disclosure, I'm very, very guilty of using items in your surroundings. Sometimes when I try to come up with a password, I look around and maybe I see a book and think, oh, there's a book title that it looks really like random and really like uncommon. So I use that for password which again is a terrible idea because maybe there's a photo of me in my room and then people who have a lot of time and criminal energy will use all this information, combine everything and come up with a really, really good dictionary. So if we combine all these things, most common passwords, patterns and information about an individual person, I think the probability that someone cracks your password or your hash password is really high. And then um, I think there's a little bit scary and how scary it is, um, I wanted to find out. And I tried to crack some passwords myself because as you, that's what you do. And there's a program called Hashcat. There's loads of other different programs out there that do a similar thing. So Hashcat basically provides us with all the, the logic to iterate through patterns and dictionaries and calculates hashes and compares them to um, a password list. And it could look something like this. There's like a command line tool. So I try to do that. And my original idea was to do a demo, but because it requires a lot of processing power, my laptop crashed several times. So screenshots um, will have to do for now. <laughs> so just to walk you through this, that's like, that's how we call it hashcat. A means attack mode. Three stands for brute force attack. Hashes is a list of hash passwords. And then I specified a pattern that I want to iterate through. In that case, it was seven lowercase letters. And force was required to actually run the program because it checked my um, graphics card and my, my processor. And without force, it wouldn't have run it because my laptop is just too weak. But the thing is, it kind of worked. And that's what I got. So you see like loads of hashes and then the clear or plain text password. And that's what I could do with just using a very simple pattern on my laptop that's already five years old. And, um, and I think it's really scary because there's people out there with like really, really good dictionaries and a lot of processing power. And then um, they can crack a lot of things in a very short amount of time. Um, that leads me basically to my last point. How can I protect myself? Well, there's loads of different ways. And I guess the two biggest ways to protect yourself is like, on the one hand, we have a password manager. And every time we did programming, pair programming in the past, or when someone shared their screen, I was always looking at their browser because usually password managers have like a browser add-on. And I would say maybe 50% use a password manager, which is, which is really, really good. But there's loads of people who don't use a password manager. And I think it's a, it's a brilliant idea to use one. For those who don't know what a password manager is, basically it's like a vault and it stores all your password 
words and it can generate random passwords at like for like any length and any character set you want. And basically you have to secure it with a very special and really strong master password. Um, but once you figure that out, it's a really, really good way because all your passwords will be unique, will be long enough, so they can't be brute forced. And then um, the last time I checked, I had around 300 passwords in my password manager for all the accounts I created over time. So um, I highly recommend, if you ha don't have one yet, have a look at the password managers. And the second thing is multi-factor authentication, which is usually a way, a combination of safety measures. One is like something, something that I have, which could be our phone, something that I know, which is a password, and then something like something that t tells the computer about who I am, which could be like a, a fingerprint or like some retina scanner or something like that. So those are, I guess, two good ways to make your password stronger and um, your online presence um, more secure. Um, well, that's it for me. Thank you very much.